this morning, Acts chapter 1. And you've heard the statement, uh, almost every service you hear Pastor Posen make the statement, uh, we're Pentecostal. We're Pentecostal. Uh, but what needs to be asked is, what does being Pentecostal mean? What's the distinctives when you make that statement? What's being said? And no doubt there's numbers of distinctives, and I may work through a few of these in the next few weeks. So. But I want to give you some maybe understanding as converts or people maybe you've been there a while and you're not absolutely sure all that means when we make the statement we're Pentecostal. Acts 1 verse 5 Jesus is speaking for John truly baptized with water but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse number 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Distinctives of Pentecost. Father, we pray this morning, God, may we be a people of your power. God, I pray, God, that it not just be in word or name only, but God, that we would reflect the distinctives of the early church, God. That we would be a people, God, of fire, wind, and witness. I pray, save the lost. God, stir us, stir us in these days, these last days. Stir us, God, for your kingdom purpose glory. Amen. Distinctives are being Pentecost. This word, most of you are aware of, uh, it's that quality or that characteristic that makes you different from others. It's a special qualities that identify you as a person, as an organization, or even as we're saying, as a church. It makes you easily recognizable. Billy Graham has a distinctive voice. People all over the world, the moment you hear his voice, that distinction identifies that's Billy Graham. In other words, it's that which sets you apart. Pentecost uh, was a Jewish festival. It was 15 days after the Passover. Of course, the Passover back to Exodus. Uh, and to you and I, Pentecost was the apostles. The early church, the 120 in the upper room. Uh, it was the day the Holy Spirit descended. After 10 days of prayer and fasting, Jesus had promised them... Uh, I want you to go, I want you to tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And so Pentecost was that day, scholars say it was actually the birthing of the church. John 16, 7. Jesus, nevertheless I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. 1613, however, when he, capital H, the Spirit of truth has come. Acts 1.5, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit but not many days from now. In other words, he said, it didn't happen at conversion. This pouring out of the Holy Spirit, this second experience, uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit, means to be submerged in God's Spirit. Uh, you are saturated with the 
third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. You are filled to overflowing with the presence of the Spirit of God. That is the term Pentecostal. This is what happened in the upper room. Paul, when he's on the upper coast of Ephesus, Acts 19, 1, finding some disciples, verse 2, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, we've not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. He said, John truly baptized with the baptism of repentance. When you're born again, when you believe in Christ, uh, in verse 6, when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. The early days of Pentecost, the great Pentecostal movement in America, uh, you know, Assemblies of God, Church of God, it's Pentecostal Church of God, they all came out of that movement, four square, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and they called them the tongue talkers. This came by the laying on of hands. Pentecost, that's our experience, uh, to be filled again with the Holy Spirit. In other words, does the Holy Spirit have access to every facet, every part of your personality? That's what it means to be filled, to be baptized. Paul writes, we need to walk in the Spirit and we'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We need to be led by the Spirit. We need to be filled with the Spirit. That's Pentecost. Ten days in the upper room of fasting and prayer, they were surrendering to the Holy Spirit. They were allowing God to have access to those corners of your will that are unsubmitted, to those crevices of your flesh where there's sin, where there's iniquity, where there's the stain, those corners and arenas of your life where a generational curse is attached to you. Is that you? Have you submitted and surrendered totally to the third person of God? Had Jesus said, I'm going to leave you I must leave so that I can send the Spirit, the Spirit and truth, who will lead and guide you into all truth, the Helper, the one that comes alongside and gives you supernatural power and ability. Be honest, we want to do our own thing. We like our flesh. Many times we like our sins. We want to do what we want to do. We don't mind many times submitting to the Holy Spirit, especially in areas that have hurt us. Areas that have brought pain and bondage. But when it comes sometimes to my anger, or when it comes to my jealousy or self-pity or bitterness or my laziness, or when it comes to my money, when it comes to my attitudes, when it comes to my will, I have plans. I've orchestrated my life. And the Holy Spirit says, no, 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 no. Jesus in the garden, Father, if it be possible, let this cross, this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Pentecost is where they surrender completely, to be filled, to be baptized, to be saturated. No hidden areas where sin can dwell, or rebellion can live, or flesh can reside. Is that you? Stephen in Acts 7, speaking to religious people. Acts 7, verse 51, you stiff-necked uncircumcised 
and hardened ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers do. Think of this. Stephen is looking at religious people. They have all of the facade. They have the mechanics. They have rituals. And he said, you're stiff-necked in heart and in ears for one reason, because you resist the Holy Spirit. If you're not careful, your religion will be your excuse and your defense against the spirit of the living God leading you, convicting you, guiding you into places that you don't want to go. They said, we don't want to hear that, Stephen. And so they defended, they excused, and they rebelled. You have to realize, wherever you submit to God, you become powerful. Because in every area of your life where there's submission, the Holy Spirit now resides there. And the Holy Spirit cannot be absent from His power. The power and the Holy Spirit accompany one another. But when you say no, when you resist, when you rebel, as to what you're doing, you're saying no to the supernatural. Newcomer. I got saved a few days later. I'm in the basement. The assembly about church. Me and the pastor were praying. I really had no religious background. I've been Baptist a bit, family Baptist a bit. I'm in the basement, and I remember I fell down on my face. I began to pray. I began to speak a language that I never learned. I'd only been saved a few days. I never really heard anything like that. And my whole world changed. From that time, I wasn't really tempted. I mean, there was a few temptations, but temptations, uh, alcohol, different arenas of my life. I had a bike. Uh, I, I, uh, that was like my life. Uh, when I got on that, I mean, you know, my marriage, I did so many things. So, uh, alcohol, curses, family curses. My father an alcoholic. My brother an alcoholic. Everybody I knew was crazy, a horrible, horrible deaths, and, and <clears throat> power of God, the Spirit. I never wanted to go to church. You couldn't keep me out of church. And that's not just true of me, that's true of many here. That's being Pentecostal. It's not just this token I feel like God when I feel like it. It's not just, well, I like it's Easter. I guess take the family, buy some new clothes, and go to church. It's a life. And you read, you cannot read the book of Acts without realizing that. Uh, changed my whole world. Acts 2 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, we were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven. As a rushing mighty wind, it filled the whole house. There appeared to them divided or cloven tongues as fire. All of these are symbols of power. Wind and fire. And set upon each of them, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance from heaven. This night, the house was shaken up. Their whole world, they were set on fire. And they began to speak with a language they never learned. All of that, they were saturated with the Spirit of God. Not just sprinkled. Not just a little splash. 
not just a little dabble, but the Bible said they were filled. D.L. Moody once said, the world has yet to see what God would do through a man totally surrendered to him. Will you be that man? Will you be that woman? Wherever you surrender to God, you become powerful because of this in, in enablement of the Spirit. Wherever you resist, you say no, you fight, you rebel, then you're on your own. It's simply what you can do. Paul, powerful conversion on the road to Damascus. You know the story. He's going to kill Christians. He's not from his animal. He's blinded. Lord, what would you have me do? Acts 9, 17, God speaks to Ananias. He said, I want you to go lay hands on Paul. And I'm going to heal him. He said, listen, we've heard a lot about this man. He said, nevertheless, I have, God said, I have purpose for him. 17, Ananias went his way, entered the house, laid hands on Paul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Are you filled? And look what this man did. From one who was instrumental in murdering Christians and put them in prison to writing two-thirds of the New Testament. Missionary, Bible teacher, preacher, pastor, worker of all of that. Are you filled with that kind of spirit? Filled with the Holy Spirit is about power. That's a distinctive. Now you're able to do what before you were unable. Before you never dreamed. Maybe you've been on the platform. Jacob mentioned his daughter. Maybe one day singing, playing on the who knows? She may marry a pastor, mission. Who knows the potential? But I'm talking about Pentecost is so powerful. Now there's this, this expectation and this faith. And the possibilities that have never entered your mind. We're talking about power that's personal. It's experiential. And it's, there's a divine boldness. Yes. It came like a fire. Hebrews 12, 29. <clears throat> Our God is a consuming fire. Revelations 1, 14. When Jesus comes uh, to the churches, the Bible says His eyes uh, were like a flame of fire. Psalms 104, 4, who makes his angel spirits, his ministers, a flame of fire. Fire burns through fear and bondage. Fire will burn away family curses. Fire will burn that which intimidates you, causes you to pull back from God's calling and purpose. God's plan. The demonic will always try to cause you to focus on your insecurities. I can't do that. God, I, God I'm, not, I'm not able. And he'll throw up your past to you. Or your weaknesses. Flaws or sin. But you see the power of the Holy Ghost. It's like a fire. Moses, 40 years on the backside of the desert in Exodus. 
40 years, she's probably thinking, it's over for me. God one time spoke to me about being a deliverer, but, but I messed up. It's over. Unfinished. Forget it. And yet in Exodus 3, 2, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And Moses became that bush. He became a man on fire for God and delivered a race of people from 400 years of slavery. Do you have that kind of fire? Isaiah, it's time of trouble. It's a desperate time. King Isaiah, he's died. The whole nation's in stress and turmoil. He's in the house of God. Isaiah sees the uncleanness of his lips. He said, this disqualifies me from being a spokesman for God. Isaiah 6, verse 5, I said, woe is me, for I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of uncleanness. What a picture of this generation. I've never seen such filth come from the mouths of people who ought to know better. I mean, you can't even hardly, uh, you can't listen to radio, you can't watch television, you can't go to a movie hardly, <coughs> social media, the filth that comes out of people's mouths. Just, just do a little, your own history. Look, 40, 50 years ago, 60, 70 years ago, what was acceptable. But watch. He said, my words are tainted. My lips are spoiled. They're corrupted. I've desecrated my mouth. How can I speak for God? But watch the Bible. Verse 6, Then one of the seraphims flew to me, having a live coal, a piece of fire, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth with it. Behold, he touched that those lips of iniquity. He purged his speech. The Holy Spirit burns away sin that has filled your language, your mouth, your descriptions, your response. It can be addictive and he burns it away. Watch verse 8. Then I said, Here am I, send me. God said, Go. Spirit of cloven tongues is fire. Jeremiah, he's discouraged. He's under a lot of persecution because of his stand for God. Under an immense attack. They buried him in a cesspool. The list goes on and on. He's frustrated. I wonder if he's thinking, this is not what I planned. Yeah. He said, listen, I, I'm not going to speak your name again, God. Every time I speak your name, it causes a conflict and anguish and people get upset. And I'm not going to declare your name anymore. God, I'm finished. The Bible is so interesting it says, Jeremiah says, but your word was like a fire burning in my heart. Spirit of God was in my bones. I couldn't hold it back. He said, I had to speak. In other words, this fire, this flame, this passion. The Word of God was down inside of this man. And it was so powerful. He said, I, had, I couldn't hold it back. Like a mother about ready to birth a child. He said, I spoke. The Holy Spirit, Pentecost, 
the spirit, the flame, the passion. Are your lips and tongue on fire for God? Think about Peter. What a contrast. Lord, I'll never deny you. All these other, they may never meet. Jesus, before the whisper crows, Peter, you're going to deny you ever knew me. I, he's astonished. And yet they're taking Jesus to Pilate. Peter's following far off. He's standing by a fire warming himself and here a little handmaid comes up. Oh, Peter, you're, I recognize you. You're, you. You've been with Jesus. I, no, no, no. You're the wrong person. Not me. Not me. Another one. Oh, your dress, your mannerism, your Galilean look. And he curses. You want to show the world you don't know Jesus. Just curse. The rooster crow. Watch Pentecost. Watch Pentecost. You know the story. Jesus reaches out to him. Go tell my disciples when he rose in and tell Peter. Peter, after Pentecost, what happened to that cursing language? Acts 2 14. Peter, standing up, raised his voice and said to them, These are not drunk with new wine as you suppose, but this was that which was promised in the last days by God. Yeah, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Hear the words, he said, Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God has raised from the dead. Verse 37, when they heard this, Cut to the heart. What shall we do? He said, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. And 3,000 souls bowed their knee that day. The church was born. That's Pentecost. Out in the public, <coughs> witnessing, speaking, declaring, delivering. Fear is broken. The past forgotten. The fire of God burns through all the excuses. See how they call this. Pentecost provides a passion for God. You can't help but notice the zeal when you read the book of Acts. This early church they were consumed with God. That's my life. It's not just an afterthought. It's not just, is that your life? It's not just a side issue. It's not just a little chapter. When I got saved, some of my Bible friends says, oh, yeah, he's, he's got religion. It won't last long. He's going through things before. You ain't call me. But it did last. It did last. 71, 70, 50 years. Oh. It was. It wasn't just a little chapter when I was hurting and crazy. Pentecost will make it life. Peter, church history tells us they're going to crucify him. I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. Crucify me upside down. All of the apostles in the early church except John were all murdered. Paul died in prison. John cast for the Isle of Patmos where we get the book of Revelation. How could they do that? Because it's supernatural. It's God in you. By His Spirit. By Spirit. 
not just a little moment. This is what Jesus prophesied in Acts 8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. He didn't say, I'm going to be praying that you witness. He didn't say, I, you know, I, I, I really hope you tell people about me. Now, he didn't even say, well, I, I encourage you to witness. Uh, um, I, I urge you, you, you know, if you really, come on, Peter, you guys, you know, I really, well, look what I did for you. Don't, don't, don't forget me. He said, you shall be. You can't help it. Listen, you get filled with the Spirit of God. You cannot help but speak of the one who saved you. Fire in the belly. They arrested Peter and John. Acts 4. They laid hands on them, put them in custody. Custody. The next day they took them to court. Verse 7. By what power or by what name have you done this? There's been a miracle happening. We'll talk about that maybe in another Sunday. Verse 8. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers, if we this day are judged, Verse 10, let it be known to you all, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you, healed and made whole. The Bible says when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, severely threatened them. I don't want you to speak in that name. Verse 18. They commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. Verse 20. We cannot help but speak. We can't help it. We can't control it. We can't stop it. We have to speak things which we have seen. That's Pentecost. That's a distinctive of being filled with the Spirit. I'm compelled. I'm on fire for God. I have to speak His name. And they prayed for boldness to speak. Acts 4.29, the Lord looked on their threats. Look on their threats. Lord, look on their threats. And grant to your servants with all boldness we may speak your word. Verse 31, when they prayed, when they prayed, do you pray for boldness to speak? The Bible says they were all assembled together. And when they prayed, there was this shaking. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the Word of God with boldness. God give us that kind of Holy Ghost shaking. Give us that kind of Pentecostal power shaking. They all begin to speak and testify. Acts 4. 32. The multitude believed. 432. With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection. Converts everywhere. Fourteen believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes, both men and women. 528. You have filled Jerusalem with this doctrine. And we commanded you not to speak. Verse 29. We ought to obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. And we are his witnesses. And they beat them and commanded them that.
they should not speak in the name of Jesus. What this were you? What if this was us? Every time you spoke his name, there would be people who I said, spit on you, curse you. Beat you, rip your clothes off. What would you do? Do we, we, we can't help it. It's the supernatural power. It's not natural. It's Pentecost. It's power to do what before you never imagined doing. It's power to be able to speak from before you.
crazy for God. Over the top radical. Not just there. Come stop. Remember that guy levitating these guys and telling them, we're we'll praying for this guy, dealing with the city.
Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. What's that got? What, what makes that work? Because when you submit to God, you become a candidate for the Spirit of God to fill that area that was before in rebellion. Some of you here, you got marriage problems. Others, you got addiction problems. Others, you got areas in your personality that keeps jerking you back. Could be anger. Could be fear. Self pity and security. Could be drugs, alcohol, pornography. Sin has so many faces. Could be your past. Every time you want to go for God, He'll throw your past in your face. Listen, listen, and, and if we're not careful, we battle in these, and I understand that. But sometimes the answer is on the other side of the coin. The answer is on the side of submission and surrender. The answer is you must get filled with the Holy Spirit, and those things that seem to have so much power and influence over you. They're like kicked to the curb. It's like that much. I, I'm telling you, I was weak. I used to make New Year's Eve promises to Connie. Maybe I'm going to check. We'll be in a club somewhere. Oh, this is change. I'm change. No, I'm not going to And I wanted to change and I meant to change. I never did change. I got worse. Maybe for a week or two. But then I was right back. Worse. It's like you've been fasting. And all of a sudden you want to eat. Temptation, especially when fasting, you eat for five days or something. I'm just going to eat some salad. That's the way I was in sin. It's like, I go crazy. But when I got through with the Holy Spirit, never drink. I mean, that mean, and I, I wasn't some big Richard T. We're slugging it out in the middle of the night, me and Jack Daniels, right? But it wasn't that at all. It's like I didn't even hardly it didn't even enter my mind. I was so consumed with God and the things of God and people and souls and church. I didn't have time to think about sin. That's many parts. That's many parts. You shall receive power. I'll ask you just to stand back from the altar. You're here. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit or refilled. Maybe you've looked out. I want you to come and stand. I want you to come and stand. I want you to come and stand. You've looked out. You're struggling. You're battling. I want to do things. I want you to come and stand. I want you to come and stand. I want you to come and stand. God, I need a fast. I need a fast. It's going to stay. Come stay. Maybe you're not even on the altar. Come stay. Come stay. Come stay. I, I, I need I need energized. I need energized. I need energized. You ever been filled? You ever spoken in tongues? No. I'm going to pray for you first. Amen. Listen, 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 listen. I want to ask the staff and the people. We're on fire for God. Why don't you come and stay? Ladies and ladies, you help me. Did you help me? Imagine us here, 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 going to help me as well.
Begin to flow rivers of living water. Let's give you praise. Let's speak to God. Oh. 